To another edition of the Al Heron Talks podcast, we've got the full complement of participants as Marcella is our wonderful producer, and of course, Miss Benita Love is our co host, and she's actually here today, not out selling. You say that all the, oh, I, was, I, know what I'm I saying. thought you were gonna say I was in Mississippi again. I was like, you say that all the time, yeah, but well, you, you're there a lot nowadays. I don't know if there's a something going on in Mississippi other than I sell real estate in Mississippi as well. Okay. All right. Okay. I didn't know if there was maybe some relationship or something we didn't know about. But uh, anyway, so uh, she is here with us today, and uh, we have a very special guest. So one of my, you know, I, I get in trouble because I always say people are my favorites, and that makes other people think they're not my favorite. And so I, I love all these people in the real estate industry. But this guy is one of my favorites, Mr. Jason Cryer who is a, a member of the leadership team here at Monument Realty. He is the office leader uh, at the Fort Worth location, which is one of our uh, vibrant locations. Uh, part, what do they call it? Uh, Funky Town is what we used to call it back in the day. Funky Town, Fort is Worth. Is it Cowtown or well, you know, oh, I don't know. I don't, I'm cow not town, know. but this, you know, you kind of <laughs> when you do cow town, you kind of <laughs> relegate it to a stereotype from back in the day. It's they're a little more urban okay. than just cow town i like fort worth I yeah, got, yeah, fort worth is cool fort worth is probably one of the most underrated of the cities and any thing for as big as fort worth is going to be underrated but i don't i think people sleep on fort worth they yeah. they sleep on fort worth um mainly because of what you just said they think they know fort worth because mm-hmm. the cow town or the stockyards and Fort Worth is far more than just those things, even though that's great. The stockyards and all this stuff is cool, but Fort Worth is a much more uh, vibrant uh, city with a lot of uh, opportunities for recreation, business. It's just a cool city. Well, Jason leads our office there in Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Worth, and he's also our education director at Monument Realty. So he has a, a background that is extensive in training, uh, agents, uh, mentoring agents in our positions as the leaders at this company, we, we really are responsible for making sure. So let me make sure I'm saying this correctly because people get this twisted and they sometimes forget their importance in this whole thing. But our job as leaders is to make sure that we provide the opportunities for all of our agents to succeed. Provide the opportunity. The the agent then has to do their thing with the opportunity. In other words, they have to then go seize that opportunity and make stuff happen. And so um, we, we don't let the agent off the hook. The agent has things that they have to do. But if they come in and they're really wanting to work and really want to uh, thrive, not just survive, we will give them everything necessary for them to do just that. And Jason Cryer is a big reason for that here at Monument Realty. So we wanted to have him as our guest today. So welcome to the program, welcome. Mr. Jason Cryer. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've been podcasting. Yeah, it, it, that's right. You, you've got a podcast going. You we and, used and, to. And, and yeah, we're going to get it back going y'all, again. Y'all get it going again. Yeah. We, we were a little derelict with our podcast. Mm-hmm. We started... Uh, you know, we got busy, right? Yeah. And then we, we, we missed a, a week or two or a month, and three, <laughs> three months, months and that kind of, yeah. So, <laughs> so we're back. and uh, But, yeah, I think the the podcast, especially what you guys are doing, you, Nick, and Cody, uh, was really good because it was giving a lot of um, help, encouragement, and, and tools that an agent can use to, to benefit their business. So that was really good. But I want to first make sure that people get to know Jason Cry, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get your background, where you're from, and all that kind of stuff. But I first, and we didn't do this with our, just kind of get back in the swing of things. We didn't do this with our other two guests. We didn't ask some questions at the start to kind of get to know the personality. And so I know, I think you you like both, but I'm, I'm curious to see if you could only go to one concert. Okay. <laughs> would it be Taylor Swift or would it be Beyonce? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, 
I will let you know. Concerts are not necessarily my favorite to go to, so I'd be going for the theatrics of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think based off of theatrics, I've got to go to Swift. Okay. Okay. So oh. concerts are not your thing because... I, I'm not big with large crowds and large noises. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. In my car, it's a whole different story. In okay. a crowd, I'm like, this is a lot. Okay. This is a lot. Yeah. So in a crowd like that, you're consumed of what? Are you thinking that this something could happen here? Is it just too many people? Is I think in this day and age, we always run those scenarios, yeah. right? But I, for me, it's more about sensory overload. Gotcha. Like you've got all of the people, you've got the the ticket vendors, you've got the sales things going on, you've got all the people in the crowd, some of them not as polite as they should be. You've got the music, it's loud. You've got the lighting going on. So at, at some point in time, I just go, I need to step away right, right. and just reconvene. Right. Do you like concerts like in an intimate setting? Love them. Okay. Yep. But Very good. Who is your favorite artist? Ooh, favorite artist. Um, I would always be a person who goes with message. So I think Pink tells an amazing okay. story. Um, and, and I am going to jump on a, an owl bandwagon. I love Sade. Wow. Ah. Yeah, Sade is the best. Sade yeah. is the absolute best. Now, Pink is good. Absolutely. Sade is the best. Um, <laughs> your playlist right now, what, what, well, I shouldn't even get the, not even the whole playlist, but what is probably the song you listen to the most right now? None. None. I literally don't listen to songs in the car. I listen Podcast. to podcasts. Um, I'm listening to anything that um, allows me to just kind of disconnect. Or I sit in silence. Gotcha. And I reflect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sit in so. silence, reflect. Well, in the car, I know you said as far as theatrics, you would go for Taylor. In the car, would it be Taylor as well or Beyonce? No, in, 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 in the car, it'd probably be Beyonce. Is it because yeah. you're like singing along? Absolutely. Have a whole concert. <laughs> you got the whole, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm choreographed. <laughs> I got everything going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. The, um, we are, Close to the same age. I'm older than you, but uh, we we uh, you know we enjoy music from the '80s. Yes, right. And so, is there is there a song from the '80s or at any point really that um, you would be embarrassed that people knew that that was your jam? And if they drove up to you in the car and you're singing that song at the top of your lungs, you'd be a little embarrassed to to let people know that that was your jam. No, no. If I'm singing and enjoying, I ain't embarrassed about nothing. No, mm-hmm. I don't th- know that there's a, a song that I would be embarrassed. I mean, if if you think about like, um, yeah, I mean, there's early Vanilla Ice, right? We were all <laughs> going to town with early Vanilla Ice. And, you know, looking back on that now, I'd probably go, yeah, I was probably a little too exuberant with that. But, uh, <laughs> At the time, I wasn't embarrassed by nothing. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. The other day, the reason what made me think of that question, I was driving and I was listening to Madonna's Papa Don't Preach. Yep. I forgot that I really liked that song like that. <laughs> and then I realized there's a car right next to me and I'm and I'm singing along with it. And I'm like, you know, the part, you know, about how she's keeping her baby. I'm keeping my baby. <laughs> <laughs> Papa don't preach, <laughs> and I so, and I realized, and I'm, I feel like they're looking at me, and I'm and I'm getting very embarrassed by that, and I'm like, ah, is it warm in here? Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> man, I'm doing a whole Papa don't preach, Scott. but that's the jam. Actually, in case you you don't know, go back and whatever streaming service you use, go listen to Papa don't preach by Madonna. That's probably one of her better songs, but less popular than some of the you know the mm-hmm. ones that we all know but uh it'll make you sing it'll make you sing to it is there a song that you will no matter what will sing to it it forces you to sing it when you listen to it in the car um there's one song that's probably the mm, i wouldn't say that the song is um motivational but the words are and that's uh shannon Doe's the road not taken okay okay and so i really um it sounds silly, but I'm one of those people who reflect a lot. And so we can get caught up in that, you know, the road not taken. And so I always kind of listen to that song with the 
um, want and desire to say, I've got to leave that road behind. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Because we can always talk about the road not taken, right? Mm-hmm. Because we know that that one would have been better, but not true. Mm-hmm. So Very good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Nice. Well, Jason, tell us where you from i know you're 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 a <laughs> texan uh you know where are you from where did you go to school and and how did you transition into real estate absolutely so um this is where the twain comes in i was raised in burleson texas mm-hmm. burleson um, okay. between burleson and joshua cleburne alvareda those were my my stomping grounds as a kid uh-huh. um as far as my uh journey it's kind of been a tour of texas so once I graduated, I went to UT Arlington. I was able to transfer to University of Houston on scholarship. Um, blessed to coach a top 20 national speech and debate team at both the University of Houston and Rice University. That makes I was like, that perfect makes sense. so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect <laughs> sense. Okay. All right. Um, and then from there, kind of went into the career world because education, even at a collegiate level, doesn't pay. So... Um, went to but did you did you enjoy it though oh, was it was it. it okay so it was just a matter of economics you're just like yeah. hey i love this but i gotta i gotta uh, I've this gotta stuff I gotta do. Right. yeah i mean pouring into those students and watching them succeed was is is everything to see people succeed period sure. is everything for me um so yeah i loved it i just i, I needed a place to live right and right. to pay the electric so right. Uh, moved into the corporate world, and it's going to be funny when I say that. My corporate world was Six Flags Astro World, okay. selling yeah. corporate packages, picnic packages. Um, so I drove around Houston doing that. And then I started to transition from that because it was seven days a week, about 18 hours a day. Not only were you selling during the week, but then you were manning the picnics during the weekend. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So you had to actually work the, the, the deal, too. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was great. In the middle of Houston <laughs> right? summer. Oh, my God. It was beautiful. Oh. Beautiful out there with all the brisket you could stand. Oh, wow. Was, and so you'd be there and then <laughs> doing all that in the summertime in Houston. Oh, yep. gross. But you could just go down to Galveston and get in that. Get in that Which isn't much better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. are you familiar with the whole <laughs> Charles Barkley <laughs> Job, the Charles Barkley situation Galveston. right now. Stop no, about I'm not talking about Galveston. So <laughs> Charles Barkley got into a little bit of a <laughs> scrape um, because the when when teams lose in the playoffs, they always say that they're going to go off to Cancun or some some place to, to a beach somewhere and just kind of relax. And so the team that Charles Barkley was criticizing. Was it the? It wasn't the Clippers. That's what Dallas played. It was uh, New Orleans, the Pelicans. They didn't put up much effort and lost. They got swept. And so instead of going to Cancun, <laughs> Charles said they should just drive to Galveston <laughs> and go to that beach. He said that beach with that dirty ass water. <laughs> now there are times when that water's clear. Yeah, I've seen pictures and yeah, video. you've seen pictures. Yeah, video. I spent a year I, there. In Galveston, yep. So he, um, Charles was excessive <laughs> in his in his <laughs> his comments about Galveston, but he did not lie necessarily, right? It's um, it's not Cancun, correct? Well, right, no. right. It's not Cancun. It's not Biloxi. It's not. I've never been to Biloxi, so I can't compare. Biloxi is beautiful. Okay, it is, but the water's not. Yeah, the water is. The water's still, not. But it's not. It as, ain't it's blue. Not as brown as. <laughs> yes. The more east you go, it gets a little more. Once you hit Alabama, it's it's pretty. But the, our our beach itself is beautiful. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, I oh, agree. I can't. There are say good the beaches same. in Galveston. Okay. There I've only are. been there, so I really can't. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 I'm, I'm on defend them. I'm on defend them, guys. That's That's got good. some good yeah. beaches. That's you good. just got to drive a little bit away. Okay. okay. Um, on the but if you're part, talking maybe? about on the seawall part, right, uh-huh. which is where all the traffic is and the restaurants and stuff, that water can be a little brown. Okay. okay. So you go but out. There are beaches okay. further down. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you can get out of the murky part and go mm-hmm. to a place where it's a little clean. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking about that in Houston in this proximity <laughs> to Galveston. I thought maybe you spent time there, and you I did. I did. Oh, I you lived for a year, on right? Galveston okay. for a year. Okay. Now, what were you doing in Galveston? Well, um, <laughs> Hanging out, hang out at the beach. That would be a, a, another business <laughs> adventure. I uh, bought a bar. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I had a, a bar in Galveston, a little twenty 
Small little 20,000 square foot bar, two story. A 20,000 square foot bar? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Galveston. I did. So what? What? It just like on alcohol, food? What, like what? Just, just alcohol. Okay. Alcohol and dancing. What made you decide yeah. to? Um, we used to go down there and visit with some friend of friends of ours who mm-hmm. owned it. Um, and they were coming out of the bar business and uh, the opportunity was made for us to purchase. And I thought... This would be great, right? Was it great? It wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> it was not great. Okay. Yeah, your hours when you own a bar are about oh, yes. 10 a.m. to about 5 a.m., right? And then the five hours you have in between, you're going home and having nightmares about the next day and what's going to happen and all the good stuff. So I did not necessarily enjoy the bar business. I made a lot of amazing, amazing relationships and friends, but as far as the business of owning a bar, I don't think I'd do that. I, I, I couldn't, I, I would never, if they said, hey, <laughs> pick one of these things for Jason. Jason owned a bar <laughs> in Galveston. I would have never picked that one. Yep. So, okay, this is after the, is pre-Houston after, this is after Houston. So Houston was uh, University of Houston, Rice University, Six Flags, um, and then that's where I moved into also in the nonprofit world. Okay. So I uh, worked at the YMCA and then moved into a smaller nonprofit. Okay. Um, and then from there, uh, that's where I also got my real estate license. So moving to Galveston, I was going to do real estate and own a bar. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, what yeah. a combination, right? What a combination. You made the relationships. Yeah, uh. absolutely. We had, uh, <laughs> uh, there was another really, really fun realtor on the island, and he literally showed homes on the weekends, but he would get a van and mimosas and drive them around to all of the properties. And I thought, this is amazing. Why can we not all do this as realtors? <laughs> so that was my dream. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so the bar, you do the bar for how long? A uh, year, up until Hurricane Ike. So I lost the bar and the house in Hurricane Ike. I got 18 foot of water in the bar and 16 foot of water in the house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we fought with insurance for about two years and then booked it. Gotcha. So you leave Galveston and come, is that San where? Antonio. San Antonio, oh, okay. You really I've have been all over Texas. Yeah, you've, you've got Texas down. Yeah. Texas. Yeah. 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 And then um, Charles Barkley's in say, trouble about that, too. So <laughs> Charles, Charles has got a, he's got a hot take on San Antonio, too. He's, <laughs> Charles believes that the, oh my the biggest this is me. the biggest women in Texas live in San Antonio. Oh. And he, he figures he's his got big, opinions. Yeah, he yes, does. He, he said does. he said it happens to be because of the churro. Oh my gosh! He said there's a there's a, there's an imbalance that oh. there's too many churros, and he said he finally tried a churro and he understands. He's like the churro, <laughs> churros are good, and churros are good. And the They're best good. churros on earth are at Disney World. Really? Oh my god! Okay, listen. The di- if you go to Disney World, get you some churros. <laughs> They're the best. <laughs> churros are the best. So now, if there's a steady diet of churros going on in San Antonio, it's, I, it I didn't experience that. I was there for five years, and I, I, I can't say that there was like a, this is the best churro place in the world, yeah. right? I didn't. I didn't so, that. Apparently, it's a big thing in San Antonio. Obviously, the, you know, I Mexican food. Texas in general, I mean, that's a big yeah. thing. Churros. Mexican food in general. Well, like yeah, Mexican, right, right, right. No, but San Antonio, but you churros, got the Riverwalk and all that stuff. Like, but apparently, there's no place that has world famous churros on the side of the building. There's not. Let Charles Barkley tell it. Right. It's a churro situation. He, yeah, he must have had an experience. <laughs> mm. So, San Antonio. <laughs> so, what are you doing in San Antonio? So, San Antonio, um, I was in real estate. So, I uh, got to work with an investment company. Um, and that was really, really fun. So uh, we had acquisitions agents who went out and found um, properties that were uh, deteriorating, and we would sell those to investors. They could be all over the world or right there in San Antonio, and I was responsible for kind of quarterbacking the remodel and then their exit strategy when they sold. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Very yeah. good. Yeah. And so you did that for how long? Uh, about five years. Okay. So you were in San Antonio for a little bit. Yeah, then. absolutely. And then I needed to uh, get closer to family. So okay. I moved back here to North Texas. Gotcha. And that's what brought me here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so get back to North Texas and then you, uh, did you go to Keller Williams? Well, you, you ran Keller Williams for, no, no, no. Where'd you go first when you got to, 
<laughs> let me not, let me. I'll, I'll try to tell the story. So you tell. So you you <laughs> move right. back to DFW and it's. Well. <laughs> so um, throughout all of my years, right. So starting in two thousand seven. Uh, when I got my license, I always maintained my license, but okay. I was that part-time realtor a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, where I was just helping friends and family. And um, when I moved here, I was, I, was, I was a little tired, right? And I thought starting a business from the ground up again, creating relationships, creating that sphere again is going to be a lot of work. Um, and jump all the way back to my time in Houston at the Y, I had a friend that I worked with there, who is now in a director position here in Dallas. And as soon as he saw that I had moved to Dallas, he uh, called me up and said, hey, I've got a position that I'd like for you to interview for. And I said, you know, if there's anything like divine intervention, that was that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went and interviewed and I became the uh, race director for the downtown Dallas Turkey Trot for a few years. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, helping the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And then I moved into um, directorship with the Y. So I was the membership director at the T. Boom Pickens Y downtown. Mm -hmm. And then I moved over as an associate director at the Moody Family YMCA. Nice, nice. Yeah. When and COVID hit, uh. um, this is where we come back into real estate. Um, I was climbing on top of buildings, dealing with air handlers at four o'clock in the morning, making sure people mm -hmm. had air conditioning when they came into the gym. And I was getting home at about eight or nine at night. And I decided if I needed to pour that much into something, it should be into me. Right. And so that's when I started looking at brokerages again. Gotcha. Go back into real estate. Yeah. And then I found Monument. Very good. Yeah. So you found Monument, and, you know, I always like to hear how people found Monument. Because Monument is now, it's only six years old. It feels like it's been around longer because of how much people know about it now. But you've been in Monument how long? You got... I was pre cowboy, so about four, going on four years. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So four years. So it was only two, relatively new. Out of, I mean, they came out of Keller Williams and yep. then uh, moved to the Star and started doing their own thing. What was it? What 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 brought you to Monument? So I had a friend who was starting in the new agent development program at that time called Seals, and uh, she had been talking about how cool this place was and all of the stuff and. I had mentioned that I was starting to, to look into brokerages, and she said, you need to, to come and interview at Monument. And so I said, okay, let's do it. So um, interviewed at Monument, and again, this is pre-Cowboys. There was a lot of, we're planning on doing this. We've got big dreams. We've got all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I sat on it for a while because I was like, my mom always said, if it's too good to be true, mm -hmm. right, it probably is, right? Um, but uh, Paul looked at me and said, Here's the deal. You've been sitting on this too long. Take a chance. If you don't like it, move on. Mm -hmm. Right. And I said, okay. So everything that they've said has come to fruition and more. Yes. So, yeah. Very good. Very yeah. good. And so then we come, you come as an agent, mm -hmm. obviously, and successful agent, doing really well. But then you moved into more of a, well, not more of, because you still sell, but you start to do more of the training and coaching and recruiting. How did, how did that happen? How did you move into that? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't in the plans. Mm -hmm. But sometimes um, it's what's not in the plans that happens. And I think it was just my natural inclination to want to see everyone around me succeed. Um, and so when given the opportunity, I was there to pour into, to help, to mastermind, to do whatever it took to see the people around me see success. Um, and that's kind of, again, when I look at the longevity of my career, that's what I've always done. Mm -hmm. And so I always fall back into it. It doesn't, I could probably be selling snow cones on the side of the road and I would have somebody else selling snow cones with me. Right. I don't know. Right. It's just the nature of where did I go into. Sure, sure. And I think it goes back because even Benita, when you talked about being uh, a coach, debate coach and all right. that stuff, yep. it seemed like a natural fit, right? The the coaching and, and training of, of people, that fits you really well. And, uh, and, and results driven too. So you want to see, obviously, when you're coaching up a debate team, you want to see results. You you, you want them to win, and Absolutely. so, but uh, they have to want to win. Sure, mm -hmm. right, and that's that's where all of this kind of has its um, correlation together. Is that 
I can only put so much into you if you're not willing to take it and go. Right. Sure, sure. And that's the same thing in real estate is that that as coaches, as mentors, as people who want to see people succeed, we can't want it more than the person that we're helping. Right. right. Absolutely. Because then it just leads to disappointment on our part. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Disappointment on our part. And then a lot of them actually just move on with their yeah. lives like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but here's it, uh, the real reason we wanted you here today is because you have a knack and we, we're kind of understating it, but we don't need to. We need to make sure people understand that you have an ability through that SEALS program and now training camp and just various leading the, the education piece for the company. You have been able to pour into, in particular, not just seasoned agents, but new agents who come in, who are fresh, you know, they, they may have been watching Selling Sunset or Selling New York or something like that, and they see all these ladies with these great handbags and stuff, and they think, oh, shoot, I'm going to go do that. That's what I want to do for a living. And easy real life, money. <laughs> yeah, easy money, easy lifestyle. Yeah. And then uh, they get a dose of reality and realize, shoot, this is okay. This is a lot harder. Absolutely. But <clears throat> what I've noticed from you and a lot of the people who you mentored and trained up, they become very successful and they can carry the handbags and drive the kind of car they want to live where they want to live, but they had to actually work. And so there is an ability that you've had to be able to make people understand that, Hey, yeah, this is the lifestyle that you dream to have. This is the work ethic you have to have to get there. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about that? So you've got a brand new, let's, let's take it from the, the perspective of brand new agent coming in and says, "Hey, Jason, I I want to I want to do this at a high level. I want to be able to take care of myself, take care of my family, uh, and live a lifestyle that you know maybe I've seen on TV a little bit, right? Yeah. But you know how do, how do, how do I go there? How do I make that happen? Well, and that's the thing is that number one, they have to realize that they have to make it happen. But if we were sitting in an interview together, right? The first thing I'm going to ask them is, what's your drive? Why? Why do you want to do that?" Right. And right. So play back with me. Why, why do you want to be a successful agent? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, my phone is going. Um, well, because I just want to be successful in life and help my family. Do you think that's strong enough to make you succeed in an industry that wants to see you fail? For me, yes. Why? Because I go after what I want. Okay, talk to me more about that. Okay. Um, I set goals and I meet them and I'm pretty driven. Give me an example. Um, this is so on the spot. <laughs> I know. It is. And, no, and, that's and good it's okay. Though, I'll, I'll release no, you. <laughs> no, but that's good though. This because is, you have to yes. know that coming into this industry, it's not an automatic win. Mm-hmm. That there are so many more, and, and both of you can speak to this, there are so many more failures than there are successes if you let the failures win, right? Every day we're faced with a new challenge. Mm-hmm. And challenge can be one of two things. It can be a learning opportunity or it can be a roadblock. And as long as you look at it as a learning opportunity and as long as you're willing to reach out to figure your way through it, you're going to be fine. But if I don't see the drive in you to really push your way through it, I don't want to set you up for failure Mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Because I remember what it was like to start in this industry 17 years ago. And that's where I get a little touchy is that in every industry – um, there are promises that are made, right? But particularly in this industry, there is no roadmap for success. It's all reliant on you. And when people make promises to you about what they're going to give you to achieve that success and then don't deliver on it, like your dreams are dashed from the beginning because you never see the light. You never see the selling sunset opportunity. You never see, I always talk about a shiny penny, right? When I started in this industry and I went to my first brokerage, which was the top brokerage in Houston, Texas, and they said they wanted me and they promised me all these things. But when I started and I had questions and they weren't there to help or that help came with a fee on top of a fee on top Mm -hmm. of a fee, my shiny penny dulled Mm -hmm. in an instant. 
and I didn't, I, I never saw the ability to be successful in this industry. And so I became that part-time realtor. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is great, right? This is extra money, mm -hmm. but this is not a real career because nobody was there to show you what it means to do business on a daily basis. And I love champions. I love all of them, but they coach to the test. Right, sure. Right. They don't coach to be a realtor. Right. Right. And so that's where my, my love for education, my love for taking a new agent, making sure that they've got the drive and then showing them the tools and seeing them succeed comes from. Well, when you have, when you're talking to a new agent and you said you can kind of <coughs> tell, you know, you don't want to set them up for failure. How do you know when it's like, okay, they're, they're not going to make it or let me just let you know now. I'm like, this isn't the industry for you. Yeah. Do it's, you let them know that? I, I absolutely yeah. do. I, I, I say this isn't the brokerage for you, right? Okay. The industry is for everybody. Mm -hmm. like, to, right now, right? The industry is for everybody. But this particular brokerage or my services aren't for you now, right? You don't have the drive. You don't have the ability to push through a problem, right? And I find those things out just like with the small little interview I did with you. Imagine 30 minutes of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I find out very quickly, you know, whether they have the drive to get through mm -hmm. and if their route, which is another thing that we explore, their route for why they want to be successful is strong enough to get them through mm -hmm. the heartache of being in real estate because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So is there a particular, you know, hopefully we're not, we're not cheating this thing because now somebody's listening and they're going to interview with Jason and they're going to, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to, they're going to know what to say. They're going to be like, yeah, I'm they're going to say it verbatim. We're going to say it just like it. Go ahead. But is there, <laughs> is there a trait? Is there a particular trait that you see or an answer that you receive that pretty much tells you, hey, you know what, this person, they're going to make it. This is, this is, this person can make it. I wish. I wish there was there was a thing, right? But overall, it's it's your intuition, it's your gut instinct that that really leads you, right? And you've got to listen to it. And there have been agents that I I didn't listen to my gut, and I said, no, 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 they're gonna be great. And sure enough, mm. <laughs> two right. months down the road, they was out the door. Um, so it, it really is. It's it's a gut thing. It's an intuition thing. It's really listening and making sure that that what they're saying is true to action. Um, and what they're saying they can back up with where they've come from. So I think one of the things I've always said that the person has to be coachable and they have to be willing to submit to accountability. Mm -hmm. So you have to be coachable. I have to be able to tell you, hey, A, B, C, and D. And we have to be able to strategize and put together a plan and then we coach you on that plan. But you have to be able to then be accountable to what is or is not happening as we're executing that plan and then be accountable enough to, to acknowledge when it is you, when you are the one who's not putting forth the full effort or you're the one who's kind of half doing something. And if you are, then we can coach you up and get you past that. We can work on the mindset. We can work on the, the tactics, but if you don't have the ability to be accountable for your actions and you don't have the ability to be coached, you know everything, right? Oh, okay, I know everything. What kills me, we get some people who come in, new agents, have a little success. We, we're really good at, the, you know, training camp makes them have to get in. They have to get their six points in six months. So this they do more business in that six months as new agents than a lot of seasoned agents do for a whole year. Absolutely. And so what happens to a lot of them, they, they know it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I know it. And I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to do my thing and whatever. And then we have opportunities for them to continue to get coached up. We do a program every morning called Good Morning Monument, 9 to about 9, 20, 9, 30. Quick little call, kind of give you some motivation, some tools, some tip techniques. And a lot of them, I don't need that. Right? I'm not doing that. I'm good. I'm good. I got business. I got business. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm rolling. I got business. Yeah. And then it's not long before the wheels start falling off. Absolutely. The wheels start falling off because you, you think you got it. You don't have it. You've been in the business three days. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have? It's absolutely true. Right? Yeah. And, and so what I'm always concerned about is the person who 
feels like, okay, I got it. I don't need mentorship or coaching and all that stuff. So I need, I'd rather go to a little fat, flat fee brokerage because mm-hmm. I don't need the, what they going to do to me? They're not adding anything to me. They going to take my money. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not quite. You want to go to a place that, that constant coaching, mentoring, adjusting, to your business because it's something you're always working on. It doesn't stay. It doesn't mm-hmm. stay the same. Right. This is like a vehicle. You're driving a car, and the more you drive the car, yeah, you, you, the car is doing fine, it's doing all that. But this wear and tear. You, you're you're doing things to the car. And so if you don't ever take time to stop, put more gas in it, change the tires, check the engine, change it, change the fluids. Right. That thing is going to let you down. And when it lets you down, it's so hard to get that thing up again and, and running. And so um, one of the things that I think you do so well is those that come in under you, you hold them accountable, right? Now, you let them tell you, okay, this is what I want to do. This is, these are my goals and all that stuff. And you you put it on them to say, define what is success. Right. But then they have to to be able to talk to you and say, okay, what do we do? this week to be successful according to to what you how you've defined it so talk about that part of it that how how you use that accountability piece in your coaching and mentoring to make sure somebody or at least give them the best shot at success i think the the biggest thing is that that i'm not directing right like we come together and we decide what we want but inevitably it's you as the agent who is determining what your plan, what your goals are, right? I'm there to strategize. I'm there to to help you set that plan. And I'm there to give you the tools to make sure that you can achieve that plan. But inevitably, it's up to you to put those tools into place, right? So when I see an agent that comes to me and they're like, oh, I'm not, I don't have any business. I'm like, cool, let's go back to the plan. What are you doing? Oh, well, I got real busy with this and I wasn't able to do that and I haven't done this and I, I really don't like doing that. And I'm like, so you abandoned the plan, mm-hmm. right? Well, no, I'm just, I, I got busy n- <laughs> now, right? But now you're not busy, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's because you abandoned mm-hmm. the plan, right. right? The biggest thing for me is so many people come in here and they are reactive instead of proactive, Right? right, we don't have a plan. We just wake up every day and go, "Oh no, let's see what the world throws at <laughs> me," right. and then I'm going to figure it out from there. And I always say, you can't adjust a plan that doesn't exist. Absolutely, and you've got to have a plan that you can constantly evaluate. Right? We may start out and we're focusing on open houses or uh, social media, right? And we've got a good strategy behind those two things. But as you go through it, you realize that open houses really just don't vibe with you but you don't open yourself up to add something else in to fill that void. Mm -hmm. You suffer through the open houses and then you've got bad energy going into open houses Mm -hmm. because you don't like them. People come in, feel your bad energy, right? right? And so you're like, I never get any business off open houses. I'm like, right, because you hate doing them, don't you? Right. (laughs) How did you know? I could see it just in the way you said it. Right. Right. As well, I mean, mm mm-hmm. So what else are we going to do? Oh, so I got it. Well, yeah, you've got to replace it with something, right? Right. Find something that you jam with. Find something you vibe with. Something that you go, I'm excited to learn more about this. If it's cold calling, right? A thousand different ways to cold call and a thousand different philosophies on how you cold call and what the approach is. And if that excites you, you're going to go out there and find all those and find the ones that work for you and maybe even invent your own. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, if you don't find what works for you or what you are inspired by, you're never going to have that success. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where that accountability comes in is just going, I can see where you're going or not going. Right. What are we doing now? Right. Right. Because the plan has changed. And so, and also too, when you're telling them they come in and then, um, a plan has been set and they're not following the plan and you bring that to the attention and say, well, look, you've abandoned the plan. Yeah. They've done more than that. They've done more than abandon the plan. They've abandoned their why. A lot of times, yeah. Absolutely. Well, no, period. I tell them you did. Yeah. Now there's no there's no if you if you then quit on whatever the plan was. The plan was, 
you're going to do A, B, C, and D. And we're doing A, B, C, and D because we want to put your child in a situation to where when they graduate uh, uh, from high school, you'll be able to pay for them to go to college and set them up for a better future. That's what you said to me. When you came in, you said, that's my big why. And so we put together a plan, and we said we're going to follow this plan so that we can fund your big why. Mm-hmm. So the days that you decide, I'm not going to get up and do this. True, true. Or the days I decide, eh, mm, we'll do that tomorrow. You have not only abandoned the plan, you have ultimately abandoned your big why. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, would, I would totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And so you got to remind people of that. And people don't like to hear that. That, that feels that's too harsh for some people but you know we we nobody is more forgiving of ourselves than than us right we we find a reason for yeah we're gonna start over tomorrow man today was just a bad day so we're gonna we're gonna go go get eat a little lunch go home watch uh, a little little young what time young and restless yeah, come restless. <laughs> young, yeah my bad young and restless. Been young and restless i think it's <laughs> yeah my bad i got it all mixed up i remember <laughs> There was a period in college. Uh oh. I digress. But there was a period in college that I started watching The Young and the Restless. In fact, I would kind of schedule classes <laughs> around making sure because The Young and the Restless <laughs> came on at eleven o'clock. Yes, sir. Yes. I don't I don't know what it was about. It was, must have been a good little stretch right there. I was like, dang, this is good. Those soap operas can hook you in once you Yeah, but here's the problem nine. with soap operas. So <laughs> I was in school thirty years ago. I remember being mm-hmm. home recuperating from surgery and turned on Young and the Restless. <laughs> and I'd be damned, it's the same storyline. <laughs> it's the same storyline from from 1990. Yeah. There's always a hospital. No, no, I'm saying it's the same people exact, involved. The same people? Victor Newman and, still and is still Yeah, Victor Newman's still alive. <laughs> I think he is. Yeah, Victor Newman, he, he was a couple of years ago. Uh, and Victor Newman having the same, you know, situation with the with same, same person, same former wife. I think they've been married like four or five times <laughs> or something like that. And I'm like, so they don't, they don't, it never, pro- the story never progresses. And so and then when I thought back to them, I was like, golly, that's, that's kind of the way it was when I was in school. So finally, you know, I just, I, I kind of weaned myself off of that and, and, you know, it was time to get up out of that. So I needed to con- concentrate. <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> what made me say that? I'm so, no, I'm saying so. I went there based on the fact that, yeah, so what people will do, they'll just move into something that's that's comfortable and I'll just yeah. start tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. Let me just throw in the white tile for today and then we'll start again tomorrow. And we know the the enemy of progress is when you stop. The moment you stop, and here's the thing, it's almost like you, you, the progression is on a, an upward scale here and so when you stop trying to go up somewhere you don't ever just stop because the momentum starts to drag you backwards absolutely so you either you continually staying in motion and moving towards the goal or if the moment you stop you're rolling backwards that's exactly it and the other thing is is that there's there's a fear which can which can totally lead to you stopping right um one of the things that we were talking about on good morning monument were you know, if there was one thing that you would say that you have to do in order to achieve your goal by December 31st, right? You've got to push beyond the fear. Mm-hmm. And every day, and, I, and, and maybe it's just me and my anxiety-ridden self, but every day we wake up with fears about a particular contract, about a phone call that we have to make, about whatever it may be. And what I started doing a few years ago is I would wake up, identify the fears, and do those first. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely just push through them to the nth degree. And what I found out is that the fears aren't that bad. You just got to do them. Yeah. You just got to do them, right? And once you get past that, the other side is so much more productive because this fear will prevent you from doing anything Mm -hmm. else. Anything else. And so if you can just push through that, just break it, get it done. Number one, you'll learn that those fears are not as big as you made them out to be in your mind. Mm -hmm. But number two, the other side of that and the productive place that you can be is incredible. You know, it's almost like working with somebody like you, a person who 
is used to coaching up people. It's almost like going to the gym with a trainer versus going to the gym by yourself. Mm-hmm. Go to the gym by yourself, you know that's going to be a, you know, you'll, you'll do a little something, right? Especially if you got your music right. If you got your music right, you can probably do a little something. I have, I'm the person who will go to the gym, and if I left my, my headphones, we just throw that away. We go <laughs> turn around and go back to the home. We go go grab a little McDonald's and go back home because you that, that's a waste. We're not doing anything with it. I gotta have the the music. I can't do it now. If I go to the gym and I'm there with a trainer, the trainer is going to say, "Hey, Al, this is what this is the plan for the day. And this is what we're gonna do." And because I know I've got the trainer standing right there, or at least in proximity, I'm gonna do the stuff yeah. and. The trainer is going to make sure I do it the way I'm supposed to do, right? Absolutely. And then even though I might not see the trainer the next day, and we, we might have maybe once a week we get together, that trainer is going to know when I show back up the next week for our next session if I did the stuff that we agreed I was going to do between then. Mm-hmm. And that trainer is going to hold me to account for that. Probably add a few more reps and they kind of, they kind of punish you a little bit like, okay, this, this is how we doing it. We going we gonna to do it right? And so there's something different about the effort, the discipline that comes with having accountability with someone. And it's it's not a it's not a punishment either. And that's the other thing that a lot of people look at accountability as, right? right. And my training was you can't hold punishment. me accountable. Yeah. You can't you, right? This is my and I'm like, right, but we're both on the same page. We want to see you succeed. So I'm just making sure that you've done the things that are going to lead to your success. So don't look at it as a negative, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're all adults and I can sit in the back and just watch. But if you want to be successful and you want my help in being successful, let's meet, let's talk, let's go. Let's do this together. Absolutely. But a lot of people don't like the accountability piece. And like you said, a lot of people will even ingrain it into their head that they know everything, mm-hmm. right? I used to work for the Y. I still can't walk into a gym and do a great workout. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 how, how many reps should I do? Right. How many sets of those reps? And, you know, I, I don't know those things because right. that's not my area of expertise. I could, right? I could get there, but with someone behind me. And that's the thing is that you have to know that we come from a place where we just want to see you succeed. Right. Right. And it's not negative. It's mm-hmm. just what it is. Yeah. Uh, another thing that happens too, and you, especially as now as an office leader too, um, you'll get an agent who's coming in, who's trying to figure out, okay, this is what I want to do. And I've got all these options and there's a lot of great options out there. Right. Yeah. We, we think, and we know monument is the best, right? Absolutely. But there's some great offices out there and they're different models, different styles. Um, but one of the things that happens to me, it causes me a little frustration. And I'm, I'm tipping off things. So when I'm interviewing people, hopefully they're not watching this ahead of time before we get interviewed because <laughs> they don't know how to answer this properly. But I do not like when I have to have, um, or when I'm talking to somebody, because this is a business, right? It you're, is. This is a, you're making business decisions. You're, these are business plans you're putting into place. But when we talk to you, you obviously know nothing about business because the decisions you're making are not based on business. For instance, the one that kills me the most is <clears throat> when we talk about cap, how much they pay into the brokerage, right? Uh, and they say, well, why would I uh, – you know, I want to go somewhere where I don't have to pay a lot to, to the brokerage, just a little amount or maybe even a flat fee because, you know, quote, unquote, I'm doing all the work. I had a lady tell me this. I'm doing all the work. So, <laughs> you're doing all the work. I said, all right. Uh, I said, are you doing all the work where you are currently? I said, yeah, yeah, I do all the work. I said, what kind of – I, I said, I got the production here, but I'm going to let you tell me what, what mm-hmm. kind of production is – what kind of production are we looking at with you doing all the work? And so, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's been a, a soft year. It's been, you know, it's been one of my best years. I said, well, I got your last two, three years right here. Oh. <laughs> Let's go. I said, yeah. so, I said, so pick it, whichever one of these in the last three is your best. So you tell me about that year. Let's talk about that year. 
And I said, well, yeah, I was doing all the stuff. Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm getting a lot of support here. And, you know, they, they have this and they got class and stuff, but I'm doing all the stuff on my own. I said, so tell me then, how much would you pay to do two to three times more production than that? What would that be worth? How much would you pay for that? She said, I don't know. If I can do, you know, if I were doing $8 million a year, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd pay. Shoot, I'd pay. I think she told me I'd pay $70,000 for that. $70,000? So seventy? You pay $70,000 for it? No, that, no, I'm sorry. I'm telling you wrong. I'm just not, that's not what she said. She, I would pay $70,000 if I could be a $20 million a year producer. That's what okay. she said. That, that right. was the, let me correct that. I don't want to miss Okay, I'll say <laughs> And I said, okay. What if you could be a $20 million a year producer and only pay $20,000? She's like, oh, of course I would do that. I said, what's... <laughs> if if I could show you right now where you could pay $20,000 and produce $20 million, would you, you would do that? She said, of course. I said, now, if I also told you you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G to earn that, would you still pay it? She said, of course. I said, so what you're saying is you would pay for the proper return on your investment. That's a business decision. Mm -hmm. And so if you're talking about going to a place where you're not paying anything, there's nothing you're investing. And so for you to expect a return, a return of that magnitude is asinine. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly. All right. I said, it makes no sense. So you want to go to a place that you can hold them accountable for the things that they are promising to do for your investment. But you better believe that place is going to hold you accountable too for the production. I said, here at Monument, we've got agents who produce $50 million a year, mm -hmm. 20, 30. We got 10, 5, so we got 8, 9. We got all that stuff. All of it is here, yeah. right? And because one person is doing it means that you could do it too. Absolutely. If you chose to do the stuff that they have decided that they would do. Right. And as I said, so you are a big factor in this too. And being in a place that provides you with the opportunities, paying what you need to pay to, to for those opportunities is a big factor. So until you understand what your role is in all of this, until you understand what a brokerage is supposed to provide to you for your investment, I don't know that you'll ever produce more than this. Right. That's exactly it. And and that's the thing that we look for all the time, right? It's somebody who realizes that we have so many tools and so many people who want to see them succeed. They just have to want it more than us. Right. Or at least even with us. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Because I want a lot for everybody. So sometimes it's hard to match me. But I'm like, if you just realize what you could be doing mm -hmm. with the tools that we have, it's worth every penny. Absolutely. But sometimes people don't want the accountability. They feel like in their minds they know everything they need to know. Mm -hmm. And they just want to hang their license so they can do their business, but then they want more. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it's not a good equation. It doesn't work. It is nothing, it, right. nothing the, works like that. The math ain't math. And that's <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so the, the thing is, I think this is a business, this is a career that people can do phenomenal things in, right? We've got, we got countless examples of it. You come to one of our monthly sales meetings, you get to see it, right? We have months, definitely when we get into the summer, where we've got, 70 something people of our 800 something agents closed over a million dollars absolutely individually in a month in a month that doesn't happen other places That's right correct. but the other places also don't have the same people that we have right That's exactly birds of a feather generally kind of mm -hmm. flock together so uh, i think it was nick saban they were asking him former coach of the alabama crimson tide great track record of success they were winning national championships like every other year and they talked to him about recruiting specifically and the type of players that he recruited. And he said, you know, they they could 
make exceptions and recruit sometimes players who might be mediocre or don't have the same kind of work ethic. But he said he was not going to jeopardize the program because the people that he's brought on are not mediocre. Amen. And mediocre people don't like tr- striving for something with people who are mediocre. Yep. Right. right. And so he was not going to dilute the culture by bringing on some folks who don't have the same level of commitment or passion or desire to be on that level. Yeah. And so when we get pushback sometimes about how we recruit at Monument, you'll get some people saying, well, no, y'all only want this, that, and that. No, we, we bring in new people. We do. But they got to show that they want things on that level. They want that level of success. I'm not saying you got to be a $50 million producer, 30, or want to be something like that. I just want you to be a person who wants to succeed at a level higher than what you would do on your own. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. That is exactly it. And, and to have that self-starter drive mentality, right? I'm going to figure it out. I, I always say, here's the deal. We can all figure everything out together, mm-hmm. or you can not figure it out on your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So bring it to the group, right? A lot of people will come into a brokerage and not plug in, right? I hang my license there. They do some things for me. I can print. <laughs> <laughs> I can go in the office and print, print right? And, and we never see them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those are, the, those are the people who aren't going to have that level of success because you've got to surround yourself, like you said, mm-hmm. with like-minded people who are pushing and making you want more. When I think back to high school and, and doing uh, debate, when I started, you had two divisions. You had novice and you had open, right? I didn't want to start in novice. I wanted to lose a lot in open because I knew that I would gain more knowledge quickly losing here than winning here. Mm. And so that's what I did. And that's exactly what we've got to do. We've got to come in and we've got to have those failures, but we've got to continue to push through in order to see those successes. And that's what I'm looking for in an agent. Wow. That was, that's powerful yeah, what you just said right there, Jason. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Do that one more time so we can get a clean, we'll, we'll isolate yeah, that, that too. Yeah, I was that, saying, that yeah, was do, good. Yeah, that we, clip for yeah, yeah, we got to <laughs> isolate that one. That'll yeah. be a little clip for, for <laughs> this, for this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, you, you know, if you, if you take some losses, which are simply lessons mm-hmm. on a, in, in, in an area that is much more, um, that stretches you, that builds you, it's better than just these little, these little easy mm-hmm. wins over here in, a, in an area that's not progressing you or making you better, right? Absolutely. And the key is to get better. And the better that you get, the, the, the more likely it is that you're able to do and fund that big why. And so exactly. that's, that's what it's all about. Yep. That's what you're all about, Jason. Thank you, sir. And this has been absolutely <laughs> an awesome <laughs> visit. And we, uh, Jason, I'll let, you know, those who of you who are looking uh, – to, to make a change, whether you're looking to buy or sell real estate, obviously, you know, we got you covered. Jason, Benita, uh, we, we, I, the 800 and some odd other mm-hmm. agents at Monument can help you with that. If you're looking to join Monument Realty, you have to do that a little bit differently. We, we, um, there is an interview process. You have to actually get into Monument through someone else. So, in other words, what we do is we, interview those who say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in, in coming to Monument. And what we're doing really is trying to make sure that we're talking to you and level setting, ex- you know, kind of setting the expectation and making sure that we do have something to offer you to make you better, to allow you to, to reach your, your goals. If we determine in that interview that, yeah, no, maybe not. This doesn't, we, we're not the place for you because of you know, kind of how you want to go about things. And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. We can leave and be friends and I'll root for you from the, from, from here doing your thing. But if you come in and say, okay, well, shoot, this is what they want for me in return for what they're going to do for me. And this is a good fit. Then by all means, we want you to come in. So when you do that, you have to reach out to, to someone to make that happen. And so Jason, if they want to reach out to you, sure. how might they, contact you sir can do it a few ways first and foremost obviously phone number is going to be 210-587-5947 you can reach out via text probably the easiest way and say hey i've got some interest i'd love to talk more 
Um, usually I'll just pick up the phone and give you a call right back. Uh, but the other way is obviously email and it's Jason Cryer, C-R-Y-E-R. So J-A-S-O-N-C-R-Y-E-R at monumentstar.com. Very good. And so, um, yeah, don't, don't delay that y'all. You'll get people who say, well, you know, I've been thinking about making a move. Uh, but, um, comfort is sometimes the, the killer of a career. Mm-hmm. You're here. Yeah. yeah. We get so comfortable in systems and processes in our day to day. We know when to come, when to go, all the stuff that we never push beyond that comfort zone. Right. But I will tell you that Monument does make it easy to transition. We recognize those pain points and that we try to um, acclimate you within our system and what we expect with education as well. So we're very, very proactive in regard to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, you know, if you've been thinking about it, we're already here. Look, half the year is just uh, mm-hmm. we, we're moving along. We were already in That's May <laughs> and moving in. I mean, we move it into May. Yeah. Is like we moved into the second week of May. Right. And so the deal is you might have had all these big dreams and aspirations. 2024 is going to be my year. Right. You're, you're going to be a boss, babe. And what's all the <laughs> different ways? I'm going to be a boss, boss babe. babe yeah. And all that stuff and all that stuff. And, <laughs> And you ain't you ain't boss babing right now, uh-huh. right? And so, and if you you still want that, you've got time, right? We 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 can help make that happen. I, I love it. I see all the, you know, the the pretty people out there, all the pretty real estate people, with all the nice little filters and all that kind of stuff. And it's just like, but in the background, it ain't it ain't that pretty, right? And they and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I make the the reality. Equal the, the I always image. say, how do I live up to my social media presence? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that is good. That is good, right? That is, hey, that's that's a chore. That's a task. You know what I mean? There's a lot of uh, my favorite song right now is a uh, is a uh, is uh, you know how you think and you say, well, should I say that? I'm saying uh, that loud. Oh, oh my Mark. gosh. <laughs> So <laughs> he said, "Oh, maybe I'm gonna hold that." Metro uh, Metro Boomin, <laughs> who's a as a music producer, Metro Boomin, oh who's part goodness. of this beef with uh, Kendrick and and Drake and all that stuff, did a um, a little little track. He just released a track called BBL Drizzy. Right, it's about you know and I'll let you listen to it and, and pick out what it is. But BBL Drizzy, and that song is so stuck in my head, and now. <laughs> When I see certain agents and stuff on oh, no. social media, that song just plays in my my head. So I'll let y'all go look it up and and put what you want to with that. But BBL Drizzy, <laughs> that's it. Have you heard that, Jason? No, it, I'm sure does, he has not. Does BBL stand for Boss Babe Living? <laughs> no, oh, <laughs> not that's quite. A, that's a good, that's okay, good. Boss Babe Living. That so no, <laughs> it it's. Uh, <laughs> Boss Babe Live? Boss Babe? <laughs> no. Yeah. no. We it, should, we it, should uh, recoin that, yeah. Re- yeah, Boss it, Babe Live. It's okay, y'all can take that. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Hashtag BBL. Hashtag BBL. You know what? <laughs> Let's go for it. Hashtag BBL. <laughs> Boss, what is it again? Boss Babe Live. Boss Babe Live. <laughs> All right, go for it. No, that's not what BBL Drizzy is about. <laughs> but... Uh, anyway, so it, it makes me kind of... It puts me in the mind of... A lot of stuff you see on social media. But anyway, y'all, have a great one. I hope you had a great time always on Al Heron Talks. The the goal is to both educate, entertain, and encourage. I hope we did at least some of that. Mm-hmm. And if so, please subscribe, like, do all those kind of things. I think I'm supposed to always say that at the beginning Comment, of the thing. Share. Comment, share. Yes. All that mm-hmm. good stuff. Jason, thank you for hanging out with Absolutely. us today. Thank, you so thank y'all. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.